and I got fired from that job for talking back to the boss's daughter. That was embarrassing. And she fired me on holiday. Welcome to this afternoon. As we've just been briefly speaking about, I know you're passionate about mental health and about mental health change and about helping people achieve their best. So can you tell me why? Because I found every good story starts with a why. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Uh, two things. Uh, first, before I start, this is an Irish accent. Um, <laughs> I grew up and I was raised in Northern Ireland. Uh, by Indian parents. And second of all, this, this unruly, ridiculous mustache is because of mental health. It's November. I fundraise for November every year. And uh, at the moment, we're in lockdown. All the hairdressers and barbers are shut, which is why it looks ridiculously unkempt. So apologies to anybody who's actually watching this. Uh, if you're not watching this, you're very lucky. Um, why mental health is important? You know, initially I started supporting causes like November four years ago. Uh, because friends of mine had lost fathers from prostate cancer and various mental health challenges. And I think in the last year, I went through a very painful divorce. And I suffered from depression before. I suffered from depression almost 10 years ago when I lost my job in the recession. That will mess you up pretty badly. And I think it's worse for men because when you can't pay the bills and you can't support your family, you kind of feel like less of a man. And I did have mental health problems then, although I wasn't aware it was a mental health problem. I just thought it was depression. And sadly, last year, it reared its ugly head when after 21 years of marriage, I got divorced. Um, our daughter went to university. It was just me and my wife left. Marriage just collapsed. We, we did try to hold it together with date nights and things like that, but it was too late. And I went through a brutal time and I suffered a lot. I suffered a lot of depression. I suffered a lot of illness, bad health. And I'm like, oh my God, I, I couldn't believe the horrors I was going through because all my friends are happily married. <laughs> I don't know anybody who's divorced. I've never really had extensive conversations about divorce in my life. And all of a sudden I'm going through this weird stuff in my head. My body is freaking out. I'm putting on lots of weight. I mean, given force-fed drugs with the NHS and take this drug, take that drug, take that drug. So everything was kind of crashing in my world. And, you know, it was the worst year of my life. And 2020 really for me has been a year almost of rebuilding and trying to get better. So career-wise, I'm very happy, but health-wise, it's been very difficult. And the good thing about Zoom is you can't see all the weight I've put on as well, because it's really bad. Uh, so luckily, I can just hide my head here, nothing else. Uh, <laughs> and the mustache distracts from the double chin as well. Um, so it's been pretty rough. And I, I think it's about coming up, becoming aware of mental health, the damage it can do to you, but also just wanting to say to people, you know what, there is a way out. And that's really important. You're not, you're not just stuck. There is a way out. There's people who've been through what you have been through and that it's really important and that it's absolutely fine to ask for help. Did you find that perhaps the way that you were brought up as a man to be the provider, the protector, the carer, did that put a lot more pressure on you, especially 10 years ago when you lost your job? Because that's just that's just one thing that I picked up. Did, did you find that those titles kind of wore you down or weighed heavily on your shoulders? It did because I'd been successful in my job. That was the worst part, but I was good at my job. I was very successful at the Guardian newspaper group, but they were hemorrhaging money. They were making people redundant. I thought I was invincible because I was one of the top salespeople there. And one day I'd ask the MD for a pay rise because I was making so much money for the company. And one day he brought me in saying, we have to make cuts. We have to let you go. You're being replaced by a graduate uh, because he costs half what you cost. I said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. I'm making half a million pounds for this business. And you're replacing me with a graduate with no knowledge of sales. It's actually insulting. And a year later, the division I ran, the event I was running collapsed. I mean, they lost a fortune through bad decision making. So I felt insulted of being replaced by somebody with no experience who was cheap. I felt insulted after six years, there was not even a leaving party. There was simply, there's a front door. Thank you for your service. Goodbye. Uh, nobody kept in touch to say, how are you? 
I mean, all these things, it wasn't just one thing. It was a lot of knock-on effects. And I think when you can't pay the mortgage and my wife had to support me as a man, you do feel less empowered. You feel embarrassed. It does hurt your ego. There's no doubt about it. It really hurt my ego. And I really fell hard. Did you find that the insult of being replaced by the younger person was a catalyst for even a further downward spiral? Yes, I, I felt embarrassed and I felt ashamed. I thought, if you're good at your job, you don't replace somebody with somebody half your age. You just don't do it to save money. And that doesn't make sense to me in the business world. And it turned out to be a terrible decision on the part of the Guardian. They made a lot of very bad decisions during the recession and they lost a fortune. Now, because they're not a public company, they're a, they're a trust. They didn't really care that much like a, a normal company would, but they made a lot of very bad decisions. But you know what? It, it's not what happens to you in life, really. It's, it's how you react to it. I reacted very badly to begin with. And uh, my father flew over from Belfast. I was living in England at the time. And he flew over and sat me down with my daughter, who was only 10 years old at the time, and my wife at the time, saying, look, you're depressed. You're going through a midlife crisis. You need help. Yeah. And I, I realized at that stage, I really did need help. And uh, so I went to the self-help section of W.H. Smith, because back in those days, you went to bookshops. And um, I went to the self-help section and with the greatest respect, it was full of women in, you know, cardigans and sandals. <laughs> I felt quite embarrassed. So I ran back downstairs to read my sports magazines. Um, okay, I'm going to get in a about that at this stage. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, but one good thing did happen because while running away in fear like a complete coward, um, I went to the sports section. I love football. And on the way there, I came across a magazine called Success. And it was about how to change your life. Now, Success was a big magazine 10 years ago. And Tony Robbins was there. Uh, there was Jack Canfield, Robin Sharma, Jim Rowan, all the greats of personal development. And I'm reading this thinking, well, I've got to change my life. Uh, I'm not going to read those books upstairs. And I'm like, oh, wow, the power of living is giving. Okay. I'm 100% responsible for my own behavior. Really? I always blame the government, my father. You know, it was like a complete light, all these light bulbs popping off around my head. And it was very emotional as well. I'm like, oh, my God. And the more you learn, the more you earn, really, because I, I haven't read books in school. Like most people, I was proud of the fact I haven't read books in school. I hated school <laughs> and I hated reading because nothing I learned in school did me any good in the real world. So I, that's why I haven't read a book in over 20 years, which is terrible, by the way. It is terrible. Um, but I started reading, you know, The Compound Effect and How to Win Friends and Influence People and The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And all of a sudden, after three months of being out of work and broke and about to lose my house, I changed so quickly. Uh, I'm getting interviews in management positions, even better jobs than before. And when I started my job, I got a coach, which changed my life. Getting a coach will take you to a different level of excellence. And all of a sudden, within three months of this new job, I was, I was doing well. Within six months, I was doing great. And within one year, I was a top salesperson. And I won the Chief Sales Officers Club Award. I won awards, bonuses, commissions, pay rises. I mean, it was just the best five years of my life. And that was all came because of personal development, of accepting the fact I needed help, of asking for help, saying, please help me out here. So whenever you're struggling, don't deal with it alone because you won't achieve anything. Ask for help, open your eyes, open your mind, read good books, learn, become better, take good care of your health. It's not just one thing, by the way. It's several things that do make a big difference. So would you say, and I have this crazy saying that there is some four letter dirty words out there. And one of them would be help because people, and I'm, I'm actually including women in this as well. They find it hard to ask for help because we haven't been in a way, um, you may disagree with me on this, we haven't been brought up to be in touch with our emotions. We haven't been brought up to be in touch with what we need to develop ourselves and to be continuously developing ourselves. So at what point did you decide to become a coach? Well, before I answer that, one point you just mentioned I think is very important about asking for help. Men are okay at asking for help in business, but not in their personal lives. 
women are fantastic at asking for help in the personal lives, but they're terrible at asking for help in business. Because <laughs> 80% of my clients are women, so I can say that very easily. Uh, I just thought, this, I think that's an important point to mention. It's a weird point, but it's an important point. No, I actually totally agree because <laughs> women tend to, uh, they do tend to browse a section of, well, they used to browse a section of WH Smith. Now it's browse a section of uh, various online retailers. But then again, it's a case of where do you start? Where do you actually start? And the thing is, you have to start somewhere. And it normally starts with a conversation or a glance at a magazine, as in your case, or something you hear or see. But there's always a trigger for change. There was, and certainly getting a coach made that difference to me because all of a sudden a good coach will get your results very quickly, even if it's just one thing. And you're like, oh, wow, I'm doing so much better. And oh, wow, I'm learning. And really, I never thought about it. They help you see things from a different perspective and they help you get this answer to solutions you didn't know the answer to. And that's oh, what yeah. a good coach, they don't say do this, do that. That's directing, it's not coaching. And that's what my coach did. And all of a sudden, I went from being someone who was managing staff for the first time and not really doing it very well. I was like, guys, copy me. Just that's all you have to do. You know, that, that's how I used to coach people. It was terrible. But it's like anything, Sharon, you do something badly, you read books, you get coached, you get better at it. You make mistakes, you get coached, you, you do it yourself, you become better. And after about a year, just to me, I would say a good year, even before I became comfortable being a coach, I all of a sudden went from being not very good to being good, to being very good, to being great. And I thought, this is what I want to do. Because when I coach people, they're having success because of me. And they're getting results because of me. And of course, in the sales world, they're all getting bonuses and having better lives because of me. I want to do this full time. But the thing was, I was too chicken because I was working in London, having a nice salary. Why would I quit that and become self-employed? It makes no sense. So um, I, I, when I left the, the Food to 100 company, I, I just thought, you know, I've been here five years. There's nowhere else to go. There's no more positions to grow. Maybe I'll go to a small business and try and grow there and um, take a more senior role on. So I joined a family-run business, which was horrible. And you should always learn from your mistakes. I then joined a second family-run business that was also horrible. And I got fired from that job for talking back to the boss's daughter. That was embarrassing. And she fired me on holiday. Yes, because she was mistreating her staff, not paying them properly. And I sent her an email saying, this is not acceptable behavior. You know, your mother's dating the boss. Therefore, you think you can do what you want. You can't. You've got to respect people. You've got to pay them properly. You just got to raise your standards, you know? And she fired me by email saying, I'm disgusted with the way you spoke to me. And that was... While a horrible situation, I'm glad it happened because that kind of shook me up and think, right, I'm never going to work for anybody else ever again. Because I'm getting older and these bosses are getting younger and dumber. And I don't like being told what to do by these young, stupid bosses. I really don't. I'm not saying all young bosses are stupid, by the way. But the last few ones I had were. And I refuse to be told what to do by people with less talent than me. If you're more talented than me and I respect you, that's okay. But if you got the job because your dad owns the company, or if you got the job because your brother gave you the job, I, I just don't want to work with you because nine times out of 10, you're going to be terrible to work with. And I wanted to make my own decisions. And so I wrote a book called Everybody Works in Sales. But unlike most sales books, which are facts and figures, my book was my life story working in London. So my years of struggle, my, having an arranged marriage, which most people have no idea what that's like, you know, spending years struggling in constant estates, working my way to middle management in The Guardian, losing my job, rising to the top of the FTSE 100. This is a big roller coaster ride. And people just loved that book and bought that book in their droves. And it kept selling for 21 weeks in the Amazon top 100, which is almost unheard of for a self-published book. So all that money, I spent it all on Tony Robbins events, on Jack Canfield, Robin Sharma. I invested tens of thousands in, in personal development. And that's how I set my business up and became a coach myself. Well, that's amazing. But... The one thing that did strike me as we were talking initially was you said, the, I know you said an arranged marriage, which is a whole different topic because that is, that's literally a um, blind date at the altar. There you go. But the thing is, you then have to just get up and get on with it. Did you ever find any common ground or, and I know I'm going to ask, did love grow or did love come? It's quite interesting because arranged marriages aren't about love. They're about security. And I never look at it that way. I've always believed in the big passionate love, the big passionate romance. My wife and I never had that. 
But what happened was, um, you know, she came to this country as an immigrant. Um, she struggled for quite a few years because she was an immigrant, sadly. But once our daughter was born, things changed. And then she grew in confidence. And then she, she set up, she became a beauty therapist. She became student of the year in London, the top place Whoa. to become a beauty therapist. She then got headhunted by a lot of people, worked for somebody for one year on minimum wage and said, I will never ever work for anybody ever again. I think in her 20s, she's saying this in her early 20s. And she set up her own business three months later uh, in a gym uh, in the English countryside, which must have been such a tough thing to do. And it was, and she really struggled for a while. But a few years later, she's a top beauty therapist in Buckinghamshire, one of the top in the country and still is today. And so she did amazingly well. I was doing great in my career. We had a fantastic daughter. Financially, we were doing exceptionally well. So I think we were there for our daughter always we were there because we were doing well in our careers but we didn't spend enough time together i certainly didn't spend enough time with her and that's my fault nobody else's so love didn't blossom but we were secure we loved our daughter and we had a good life you know a lot of people i know over the years have had arranged marriages and i sadly didn't work or they lived together with resentment because they didn't want to upset their parents i don't want to upset my parents either but it got to the point where sometimes you're in a restaurant sharing and you see an old couple together and you can just tell they don't want to be together <laughs> or they're not saying a word to each other. And I'm like, I do not want that to be me. I just don't. So I made a very difficult decision, a very painful decision, which caused an avalanche of pain for so many people. I didn't realize how much pain it would cause for my parents, my in-laws, my friends, everybody, in fact. But it was the right decision to do. It just yeah, caused a lot of pain. Technically, it's bringing shame on yeah. the family. And... That's another word that I'd like to eradicate from the English language, that and yeah. stigma, because everybody has a right to be happy. Everybody has a right to choose. And the thing is, as beautiful as your daughter is, and as much as you're there for her, she needs to see a stable relationship as she's growing up and what she would expect for her future. Does that make any sense? Yeah, of course it does. But how did you handle that divorce? Did it rock you? Did it bring you back down again? It destroyed me in ways I never thought it could. Um, I think I never experienced anything like this before. And first of all, it's like the stage of grieving where you're crying like you've lost somebody. Literally like you've lost someone. That, that's what it's like. And you're more morning and you're crying you cannot understand why it's like this makes no sense and i think the second problem was we're both living in the same house that made it really bad because we had a big country house mortgage to pay i couldn't afford to live my own and I could see. so we're both living in the same house separate rooms separate floors but not talking which made it worse and our daughter was at university which made it even worse you know and because she wouldn't speak to me and i was just i wanted to move on with my life so I, I started joining dating agencies, which I wasn't ready for mentally in my head. But I thought, oh, I'll try and move on and meet somebody else. <clears throat> but I was so stupid, I didn't change the passwords in the computer. So she saw all the conversations I was having with other women. <laughs> it's, just, it's just one bad decision after another, really. Um, but the thing that affected me most, which I didn't see coming, was my health. So um, I got arthritis in my legs. And I started to walk with a limp. And I got scanned as, and I, I got osteoarthritis. My, my GP said, look, a lot of this is because you're a mess at the moment. You're very depressed. You're suffering from depression. But the problem the NHS is all they do is give you prescription drugs. Uh, prescription drugs don't solve your problems long term. And then they, they, they sent me on to social workers to deal with people who are at risk. And they give me more drugs. Got to tell, I said, look, I don't want drugs. Stop giving me drugs, okay? There has to be a better solution. And nobody had a better solution for me. And ironically, the people who helped me weren't the NHS. It was joining a walking group and doing a walking and being with other people who'd been through trauma, like, uh, you know, many of them in the group were widows. Many had been through cancer. So they'd been through trauma. And the second thing was taking CBD oil, the highest strength legally <laughs> you could buy in the country. And, I mean, marijuana would be ideal, but I I'm not one of these guys that has friends who smoke joints. None of my friends smoke joints. So CBD oil, not that nonsense you get in the shops in Holland and Barrett, the proper stuff you get online like Provacan, 2,400 milligrams, the stuff you, you just put two drops of it. It's like, whoa. But it helped calm me down. The walking helped calm me down. Uh, being positive helped calm me down. You know, um, all these things made a difference. I, I did a lot more charity work 
that can be done. So, you know, it wasn't a quick fix. You know, it took several months for it to work, sadly. Uh, but then I started asking for help in the walking group. And people are actually very generous with their time. And you're surprised in life when men go through problems and suffer mental health problems. They don't realize that they often think they're the only one going through this. And they're not. There's people, there are problems you have in life. There's a very good chance there's other people around you who've been through it as well. And because I asked for help, very, a lot of men don't, but I asked for help. I think I got through it. Or ask, I know men have been depressed for years. I don't understand that. Just ask for help. I was depressed for six to eight months, which felt like years. But I got help from people around me who'd been through it. And I got better. Yeah, I, no, the reason why I'm uh, so interested and so determined to empower people to make decisions about their mental health is that someone very close to me, um, a member of my family, uh, has suffered from extreme depression for years and years and years and years and years. He then got involved in a domestically violent relationship where she was controlling him. I now um, know somebody very well who is in a domestically violent relationship where she is controlling him also. And what I wanted to bring to the surface was Abuse is abuse, no matter where you are, no matter who you are. But I also wanted to bring mental health issues to the surface, because if we take away the stigma about mental health issues, then that's a start. Then that's a start of getting people to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And yes, I know I'm female, last time I checked. But what I will say is that we have to work together to create change. Somebody said to me recently, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to create a tsunami, a change. And they went, why a tsunami? I said, because I said, it's the use of, of word. Yeah. I said, if you say to me that, oh, it's going to be pouring with rain, howling with wind, you're going to hunker down in your house, sit down in a Netflix box or play around on social media or do whatever. But if someone tells you there's a tsunami coming, you take action, you run. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to enforce people to take action. And by doing these series of interviews, highlighting how people who are successful have still felt the same as everybody else does. And you are right. Divorce is a grieving process because that life was that life you knew for 20 odd years. You didn't know any other life. So you had a total change. And the thing is, there is plenty of divorced people out there. I do work with men who come to me and say, can I ever just get someone to love me for me? And that I don't think that's a point that's acknowledged very often within the not very many men will actually come and say, I need someone to love me for me. And I mean, I work on various different levels. Yes, I've seen some pretty powerful success stories. Yeah, that, that have been amazing where people have no confidence, no self-esteem and it's fear and it's fear of not being what we categorize as normal. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I think you brought up a very good point earlier because I'm now doing online dating at the moment. And when you're single and doing online dating, it is horrible for a start. You meet a lot of people who aren't who they say they are. I find it ironic that so many women complain they can't find the right guy. And then when you meet them, they're 10 years older than their profile, or they're still married, or they're trying to solicit money from you. You know, I'm like, I'm like, stop complaining you can't find the right guy whenever your behaviors are just as bad as men. Or some women on their dating profile, I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. I want a guy told, oh, by the way, you have to be more than five foot 11. Oh, and you have to go to the gym. And they have all these demands. I'm like, really? Is this Maybe this is why you can't find anybody. So yeah, online dating is a different minefield completely. Oh, I, I, got, I mean, I was brought up in Ireland um, in the 80s and 90s. And that's where you met your partner. You met them in a nightclub or you met them in a pub. <laughs> um, you, di you didn't meet them through an arranged marriage number one but then often the person that I never I have never really drank and the person that you'd meet in the nightclub would be like mm, is he going to be that person when he sobers up 
or you know you, you never know what what would happen but um what i'm finding it and that's another point things have changed times have changed and times have changed a lot and especially with covid now things are changing even more because uh i mean i'm another one of these that hasn't you know been sitting at my desk sitting working at my desk and i'm looking at the pounds going on kind of going oops need to get walking <laughs> good job it's from here up <laughs> yes, um, very very true very very true so with regards to your career what's next with my career i've been very lucky because you know i think having worked through two recessions previously whenever lockdown happened this year i was i just dealt with it very well so i spent the first week helping all my friends who lost whose high street stores were being damaged and a lot of charities had seen their revenues plummet i just spent a week helping people uh, just to help them one, one thing i hadn't realized that would happen was it really started to differentiate me from other coaches out there because let's be realistic every man and his dog now is a coach it's it's, it's irritating how many people are coaches now with zero not just qualifications that's not important but just zero experience They're just calling themselves coaches now to find work i know so many business coaches who can't find work who are now sales coaches. And as you can imagine, being a sales coach, I don't like that. And they're all teaching sales now because they can't find work as business coaches. But I rebuilt completely. So I lost my speaking slots at events because they're all shut down. I lost all my corporate training in London because all the offices are shut. So I rebuilt very quickly. My second book came out, thank God, that did really well. That was due out in July, but I released it three months earlier. Um, I launched a mastermind group. I did 17 episodes of a sales and well-being podcast with a co-host. I do master classes, paid for master classes every single month. Thanks to our mutual friend Taz, who said, Stop calling on webinars, call the master classes and charge more money. Double your rates, you know. So she was brilliant, helped me do that. And now that's how I'm making my living. It's through book royalties, master classes. You don't make money through a podcast, you do that more to help other people, but the mastermind groups, all these new areas of revenue from new people as well. That's the thing. Most of my money is from new people now. And I'm really proud of that. And that's something I think if lockdown happened in 2018, I wouldn't have been able to deal with it very well. But because I ran my own business for a few years, I've been through two recessions. I'm kind of older and wiser, so to speak. So I've been, my business has done well during lockdown. I can't complain. It's been tough for me, but it's done very well. Yeah, actually, that's bringing, that's bringing up um, a, a little thing that Taz uh, has said. It's building up a trust bank. Exactly. And it's a very, very good saying that she has because this total life change expert has a coach too. Yeah. And um, said coach is very polite about pointing me in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's important. Everybody needs a coach. You know, yeah. I see so many people who during lockdown did nothing. They kind of waited for the government to help them or they waited to kind of just, let's see what happens, which is the worst thing you can do. Um, but the ones like ourselves who kept investing and kept growing were the ones who did well. And the ones who are whining, complaining, criticizing, doing nothing, they're still doing nothing, which is incredible, you know? I'll tell you something now. I went back to work on the 1st of May during lockdown because I had built up all of my credentials over years and years of training. And it was a case of right now or never. Yeah. <laughs> and just did it. 